want to read for you an introduction to a message that was by a Baptist minister of a rather large southern congregation. And see if you can figure out, in his introduction, who he might be referring to. So I quote, In my opinion, there is a tragedy occurring that is far worse than anything grave robbers can do. It is the tragedy of grace robbers. And grace is more valuable than gold or silver. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul was in prison when he heard some false teachers were going around to the churches and teaching a doctrine that said Christians had to obey the Old Testament laws of God in order to be accepted. The theological label given to these false teachers was Judaizers because they were telling believers that they had to live like law-abiding Jews before they could be real Christians. They were grace robbers, and we have a new generation of them with us today. They stand in pulpits and teach Sunday school classes, and they write books and fill the pews of every church. They would never call themselves legalists or grace robbers. They just haven't discovered the liberating power of grace. Because this is such a problem today, I'm going to devote four weeks to this series I've entitled, Beware of the Grace Robbers. If you were here last week, you remember we talked about what was nailed to the cross of Christ. In addition to our sin and shame, along with Satan's power, God also nailed all the Old Testament regulations to the cross. That means we have been liberated from having to observe the hundreds of trivial Old Testament regulations we read in books like Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Remember, I said the moral law of God is still in effect, It is still wrong to murder, lie, and steal, but the ceremonial laws of God had been repealed. Unquote. Brothers and sisters, everyone here and everyone in our life, all of us believe something about something, don't we? We all believe something about something. Would you agree? As I shared last Shabbat, many believe that abortion is an okay procedure for numerous reasons that are cited politically and in the news. What we discovered last week is that their arguments given failed both morally and scientifically. Now, I found a lot of what we believe is predicated upon what we want with little to no basis on truth. We just want to believe it, right? We just want to believe it. Even though evidence, in fact, would tell us otherwise, it doesn't matter. It's what we want to believe. And so we believe it. Wanting to believe something like when someone dies, they automatically go to a better place. Everybody seems to believe that these days. But that kind of belief finds its basis in emotion, finds its basis apart from any rational means to support our premise. It's important as believers to be able to articulate what we believe because souls are on the line. Souls are on the line, ours as well, as well as theirs. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? What evidence, what fact or standard do you you base your belief upon? You know, this morning's portion from Parsha Imor, it's short and it's to the point. You are to keep my mitzvot and obey them. I am Adonai. Not a lot of wiggle room there, is there? And it's what most of us here believe. That's why you're here. That's why you worship on Shabbat. But why? Why do you believe it? Can you articulate that? The majority of believers in and followers of Yeshua do not. They do not believe that. 
They believe differently. Your family, your friends, fellow followers of Yeshua, they all believe differently than what you believe here today. The common held belief is that this command no longer applies to what they would describe as the New Testament church. That Yeshua in the cross negated these, all these Old Testament regulations and requirements. Well, the following scripture, if you don't know, is the prominent proof text used to put forth the argument that the Torah no longer applies to the people of the way of Yeshua. And so we're going to read it together. In fact, please rise at the reading of the word. And read along with me, please. Therefore, just as you received the Messiah Yeshua as Lord, keep living your life united with him. Remain deeply rooted in him. Continue being built up in him and confirmed in your trust the way you were taught so that you overflow in thanksgiving. Watch out so that no one will take you captive by means of philosophy and empty deceit following human tradition, which accords with the elemental spirits of the world, but does not accord with the Messiah. For in him bodily lives the fullness of all that God is, and it is in union with him that you have been made full. He is the head of every rule and authority. Also, it was in union with him that you were circumcised with a circumcision not done by human hands, but accomplished by stripping away the old nature's control over the body. In this circumcision done by the Messiah, you were buried along with him by being immersed. And in union with him, you were also raised up along with him by God's faithfulness that worked when he raised Yeshua from the dead. You were dead because of your sins, that is, because of your foreskin of your old nature. But God made you alive along with the Messiah by forgiving you all your sins. He wiped away the bill of charges against us. Because of the regulations, it stood as a testimony against us. But he removed it by nailing it to the execution stake. You may be seated. The following I'm going to read, there's a litany of commentaries out there, right? If you're doing a little Bible study, we have all these reference books that we can go to, Vines and Matthew Henry's you know, concise commentary. There's all kinds out there available to you to help digest, process and digest scripture, commentaries. Well, this is from Matthew Henry's concise commentary on this portion that we just read. And I quote, there is a philosophy which rightly exercises our reasonable faculties, a study of the works of God which leads us to the knowledge of God and confirms our faith in him. But there is a philosophy which is vain and deceitful. And while it pleases men's fancies, hinders their faith, such are curious speculations about things above us or no concern to us. Those who walk in the way of the world are turned from following Christ. We have in him the substance of all the shadows of the ceremonial law. All the defects of it are made up, <clears throat> excuse me, in the gospel of Christ by his complete sacrifice for sin and by the revelation of the will of God. To be complete is to be furnished with all things necessary for salvation. By this one word complete is shown that we have in Christ whatever is required. In him not When we look to Christ as though he were distant from us, but we are in him when by by the power of the Spirit we have faith wrought in our our hearts by the Spirit and we are united to our head. The circumcision of the heart, the crucifixion of the flesh, the death and burial to sin and to the world, and the resurrection to newness of life set forth in baptism and by faith wrought in our hearts prove that our sins are forgiven and that we are fully delivered from the curse of the law. Through Christ we were dead, and sins are quickened. Christ's death was the death of our sins. Christ's resurrection is the quickening of our souls. The law of ordinances, which was a yoke to the Jews and a partition wall to the Gentiles, the Lord Jesus took out of the way. When the substance was come, the shadows fled. Since every mortal man through 
is through the handwriting of the law, guilty of death. How very dreadful is the condition of the ungodly and unholy who trample underfoot that blood of the Son of God, whereby alone this deadly handwriting can be blotted out. <laughs> that's what people are reading. And that's what many of you have read from, those kinds of commentaries, to process the Word of God. It goes on to say these words. Let not any be troubled above bigoted judgments which related to meats or the Jewish solemn, solemn, solemnities, 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 solemnities. I, I, and I was an English major. <laughs> solemnities. Many moons ago. Thank you, Vic. Thank you for that. The setting apart a portion of our time for the worship and service of God is a moral, unchangeable duty, but had no necessary dependence upon the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath of the Jews. The first day of the week, or the Lord's Day, is the time kept holy by Christians and remembrance of Christ's resurrection. All the Jewish rites were shadows of gospel blessings. Quote, unquote. In their struggle, brothers and sisters, to find a New Testament scripture that supports their misconception that the curse of God's law, his instruction or Torah, have been done away with, many theologians, pastors, rabbis, and fellow followers of Yeshua point to our portion today, Colossians 2.14, or not our portion today, but one we read from, as the proof that Christ nailed the law of God to the cross. Therefore, we are no longer required to keep God's harsh Old Testament law. Now, proponents of such teachings say that the phrase, the bill of charges, as David Stern translates it, but more commonly read from the King James Version, handwriting of requirements or ordinances, refers to the law, this was against us. Hence the conclusion, Christ took it all away or abolished the law. And thus, this is what the majority believes and why. Is this accurate? Is this an accurate or correct interpretation of this passage? Well, if you say no, how can you argue it? How can you state your position? And that's what I'm going to give you today, brother. Is it true that many, that so many have been taught to believe that Colossians 2.14 does away with God's Torah, his law? What is this handwriting of requirements as translated by the King James Version? What was really nailed to the cross? Now, as in any credible scriptural exegesis, we must examine the context. I've told you that numerous times. The context of the letter itself and the historical context or circumstances that the letter was written in. In verses 11, chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, explains what the Messiah did for us and how those who had believed in him are now spiritually circumcised. And again, I read from Colossians 2, 11 to 13. Also, it was in union with him that you were circumcised with a circumcision not done by human hands, but accomplished by stripping away the old nature's control over the body. In this circumcision done by the Messiah, you were buried along with him by being immersed, and in union with him, you were also raised up along with him by God's faithfulness that worked with when he raised uh, Yeshua from the dead. You were dead because of your sins, that is, because of your foreskin, your old nature, but God made you alive along with the Messiah by forgiving you of all your sins. Now, what Shaul is explaining to the congregation at Colossae is the means of our justification. Rabbi Shaul is saying that when we repented and we were subsequently immersed or baptized, the old nature of sin was buried in the watery grave, and our sins were completely forgiven through our faith in the uh, sacrificial atoning work of Messiah Yeshua on that tree. And after being raised out of the water, we were made alive, he said, with, with him and imputed to be righteous in God's sight. 
Shaul refers to this process as circumcision not done with human hands, that this is a spiritual circumcision. So what about this bill of charges, or as translated in the King James Version, handwriting of requirements? What about it? Well, if you'll notice, the first... If you will notice... Somebody could shut off their phone, please. Okay. <laughs> wow. If you'll notice, the first part of verse 14 continues the sentence begun at the end of verse 13. Shaul continues to explain how our justification was accomplished. And thus the whole sentence reads, Colossians 2.13, you were dead because of your sins, that is, because of your foreskin, your old nature, but God made you alive along with the Messiah by forgiving you all your sins. He wiped away the bill of charges, the handwriting of requirements against us. Because of the regulations, it stood as a testimony against us, but he removed it by nailing it to the execution stake. So what is this handwriting of requirements that Rabbi Shaul is referring to? And so to unpack meaning, it's always best to refer to the original language. And of course, in this case, since the, the Ketavei uh, uh, HaShachim is in Greek, that is the original language. So bill of charges or handwriting of requirements is translated from the Greek phrase chirographon toi dogmasin. So chirographon means anything written by hand, graphon, anything written by hand, but can more specifically reply to a legal document or a bond or a, a, like a loan. You, you sign on the bottom line of a loan, a, a note of debt. Dogmasin refers to decrees or laws or ordinances. And in this context, it means a body of beliefs or practices that become the guidelines governing a person's conduct or the way of life. What Shaul is saying that by his death, Yeshua has wiped out the note or the guilt or debt that we owed as a result of our sins, which resulted from our previous way of life. God willing, it was your previous way of life. Before teshuvah or our repentance, our lives have been governed and not by the, world, by the word as it was in the past, but by the standards and values of the present evil world, the decrees, laws, and ordinance of society that we live in today. It's a different standard. It's a different way. And that's why you stand out as a peculiar people. Now that we have repented, and we've accepted Messiah Yeshua, we've embarked on a new way. We are people of the way of Messiah, his way of life. We're living God's standards. We're living according to his values. Consequently, God has wiped out the bill of charges we acquired as a result of our sins and imputed righteousness to us. Now, see, in Judaism, the relationship between man and Hashem, or God, was often described in this manner as that between a debtor and his creditor. I read this rabbi, I read this from a rabbi who wrote once, he said, when a man sins, God writes down the debt of death. When you sin, he's writing down the debt of death. If a man repents of the sin, the debt is canceled. If he does not repent, what is recorded remains genuine. That's the Judaic thought. There's a, uh, an apocryphal work called the uh, Apocalypse of Elijah. And there's actually two versions of it. One is uh, a, a Coptic Christian fragmentary version, and there's also a Hebraic or Jewish version. And it is a description of an angel holding a book explicitly called the Chereographon, in which the sins of the prophet are recorded. It says Samuel Bacchiocci, very Italian, he's also a Seventh-day Adventist and theologian who's written extensively on the significance of the Shabbat. And he says these words, on the basis of these and similar examples, it's quite obvious that the chirographon is either a certificate of sin indebtedness or the record book of sins, but not the law of Moses, since the latter, as is wisely pointed out by another theologian Weiss, 
is not a book of records. So another means of ascertaining what handwriting requirements means is to notice that it restates the phrase immediately before it. I'll read it for you. Having wiped away the bill of charges against us parallels having forgiven you all your sins. Thus, Rabbi Shoal could not be referring to the law itself, but rather to the record of our transgression of the law, and that is sin. If not when the Torah, as we so frequently hear, what then was nailed to the cross? Note the last sentence in verse 14. But he removed it. You have to pay attention to these little subtleties. But he removed it by nailing it to the execution stake. So in this sentence, the word it is a singular pronoun and refers back to the singular word, bill, or handwriting. Charges or requirements could not be its antecedent because requirements is plural. So some kind of handwriting, a note, a a bill, a record, or citation was affixed to the tree. Nothing else. No rules, regulations, moral law, Torah. Now, my son Michael, I don't know if you'd be happy I'm telling you this, he recently got a little letter in the mail. And the letter stated that he was busted for speeding. Well, how, what do you mean? Well, in certain suburbs in Cleveland, they had those little cameras. So he was going a little too fast in a suburb in Cleveland, and they cited him. Cited him for speeding. <laughs> he wasn't too happy about it. Um, when he pays a citation, will that remove the law? No, the law is going to exist. No, but rather the charge against him, as the law requires, will be satisfied. Historically, only two objects were ever nailed to an execution stake, a stake of crucifixion. Only two objects. The condemned person, obviously, and an inscription naming the crime for which he was punished. Quoting David Stern, commenting on today's Ketive al-Shachim portion, when a criminal was executed on a stake, it was customary to nail a list of his crimes on the stake, an example is a sign placed above Yeshua's head. Now, some interpreters take this verse to mean that God removed not the charges against sinners, but the Torah itself. Thus, when Yeshua was crucified, only his body and Pilate's inscription, Yeshua from Netzaret, the king of the Jews, was nailed to the cross. In fact, did all the synoptic gospels record? Normally, the inscription would be more accusative. It might say something like, this is Yeshua of Netzaret, who rebelled against Caesar, who did some heinous act, and he's guilty. Not this time. Pilate's complimentary inscription replaced the customary note of, or record of guilt, the handwriting of requirements that would have been found nailed to the crosses of the two criminals crucified to the left and right of him. Just before he died, when Yeshua cried out, Ali, Ali, lama shavachtani, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? All our sins were symbolically nailed to the cross in his body. He himself bore our sins in his body on the stake so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. That was written by Kepha. Kepha or Peter. So at the time of his crucifixion, Yeshua HaMashiach became sin for all of us. And declared Rabbi Shaul, God made this sinless man be a sin offering on our behalf so that in union with him, we might fully share in God's righteousness. Amen? So brothers and sisters, our bill of charges that we owed God as a result of our sins is what was taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. Not the Torah, as most Christians have been lied to. Either they've been lied to, or they've been misled by ignorance. But either way, 
it is an untruth. As the New Testament church would have you believe, the Torah is not against us or contrary to us, but a great blessing to us. And I know you're not going to like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. When you support churches, you are supporting that mindset. When you are torn between church and synagogue, you might want to think about that. In obeying them, in obeying the mitzvot of God, there is great reward. We're told that in Psalm 19. Shaul clearly writes in Romans 7, 12, so the Torah is holy, that is, the commandment is holy, and it's just and good. Now, he wrote that before there was a New Testament. He wrote that before those writings ever existed. He's talking about the Torah. He's talking about the Word of God. And we now see that far from doing away with the law of God, Rabbi Shaul, in, in the portion we read together from Colossians 2.14, explains a deep and a profound truth, and it is the doctrine of justification. And Shaul describes to us the manner in which we are reckoned righteous in God's sight through faith in the sacrifice of Messiah. Our master paid in his own body the great debt which we owed, which we owed God because of our breaking of his holy and righteous mitzvot. Now our sins have been taken out of the way and nailed to the tree and have risen from the watery grave. Hopefully you've all been immersed. We now have the promise of eternal life as we live a new way of life. It's a life, observant life of holiness and service to God. Now, since the law, as so many in the Christian world that refer to it, the Torah, literally God's instructions for life, doesn't sound so bad, does it? Since it was not nailed to the cross, <laughs> we're left with a mystery. What was? Well, Romans 1, verses 15 to 60, Rabbi Shul declares, I am eager to proclaim the good news also to you who live in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the good news, since it is God's powerful means of bringing salvation to everyone who keeps on trusting, to the Jew especially, but equally to the Gentile. It's what really was nailed to the cross that explains Rabbi Shaul's eagerness, eagerness to share with us and proclaim the good news. The first thing that was nailed to the tree was sin. Sin. And again, reading second, from the second letter, Rabbi Shaul wrote to Corinth, Yeshua became sin who knew no sin. And that's why Shaul loved to preach the cross because he saw sin defeated there. It wasn't that Yeshua just died for the sins of the world, but he took sin and he carried it with him unto the tree. And you have to understand, Rabbi Shaul, taking such an extreme theological position as the Jew of Jews, to talk about the cross and talk about being delivered from sin was bold, if lacked for better at words. That's what put his life on the line each and every day. The second thing that was nailed to the tree was the curse. The curse spoken of in Galatians 3, 13 to 14, because it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Cursed. Yeshua became a curse so that we might become a blessing. And what humankind lost in the garden through the first Adam, Yeshua erased it by being nailed to his tree. Third thing that was nailed to the tree was fear. Reading from Hebrews 3, or Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 15, who all their lives are subject to fear. Humankind was bound by fear that the judgment of God was going to be very severe on us. But Yeshua nailed that fear to the cross, and now we no longer have the spirit of fear. But we have love, and we have power, and we have a sound mind. Perfect love casts out all fear. Fear not. 365 times I've told you. That's what God tells us. Fear not. It's like the song that was played recently. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. The next thing that was nailed to the tree was death. Death. From Romans 6, 4, verses 8 to 9, Paul, Rabbi Shul, loved to preach the cross because it was a place that death was defeated. 
And at the cross, we're united with him in death and resurrected with him in glory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Shaul states to his apprentice in 2 Timothy, Yeshua abolished death and brought life and immortality. That should be a reason to celebrate each and every Shabbat. And then what was nailed to the tree was enmity, separation, isolation. You who are far off are made near, Rabbi Shaul said to Ephesus. In Matthew 27, 51, the rending of the Mechitzah, the temple curtain represents Yeshua breaking down our separation from God. Full atonement has been made, we read in Hebrews. Yeshua goes as a forerunner into the most holy place, into the presence of God, we read in Hebrews. Messiah is our mediator, standing before God on our behalf, again in Hebrews. Saints now have access in the favor of God through Yeshua HaMashiach. All all these scriptures from Romans to Ephesians to Hebrews all state we can now boldly approach the throne room of God. Nothing keeping us back from the presence of God. The next thing that was nailed to the tree was defeat. And so many of you live in defeat. So many of you live carrying your faults and your failures. Yeshua nailed all your defeats and failures to the tree. We are made righteous in Messiah Yeshua. We walk or should be walking in victory. You should walk in victory. And thanks be unto God who gives us that victory, who always causes us to triumph. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. We read in Yochanan 10.10, but I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Hasatan's dominion was nailed to the tree and his authority in this world. Yeshua disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them. He triumphed over them. And this is the great news of the tree. What humankind lost, Yeshua restored and gave the authority back to us. We read from Breshit or Genesis 3.15, you will bruise his head, but he will crush your head. Well, you'll bruise his heel, but you will crush his head. Yeshua was wounded for our transgressions. But Hasatan was crushed by the cross. Rabbi Shaul in Romans again states, Yeshua will crush Hasatan under your feet shortly. You know, the phrasing in conclusion, and it's going to be short and sweet today, the phrasing Shaul chooses to use in Colossians 2.14 shows that the commands, the mitzvot of God, they carry great force, great significance. And that's why it troubles me how so flippant the church is today regarding God's mitzvot of commands, how careless they are with God's truth and his word. By saying the penalty demanded under the commands of God was nailed to the instrument that killed Messiah. Shaul was showing that the Torah God was still in force, still requiring death for sin. By contrast, if the law had been brought to an abrupt end by the death of Yeshua on the tree, from that point on, think about it. Nothing would be against the law. Nothing could be called sin anymore. Does anybody catch that? <laughs> if you nail the standard by which we are judged on the tree, then what standard is there? Of course, we know that the Torah or the law or God's instructions was not nailed to the tree. It is not true. You know one of the things I've noticed today that's really hard for people? Is to call a lie a lie. It is misinformation. It is not accurate. No, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's not true and it's a lie. Sin exists. Sin exists. We've all sinned. You sinned before you came here. We've all fallen short. Which means the Torah that calls it sin must still exist. Common sense, people. 
Quit drinking the Kool-Aid, the, the Christian theological Kool-Aid, and start going to the Word of God. Quit doing that. Sin is still happening, and the way we know it's sin is because we have a standard by which we can judge what is of God and what is not of God. And even though the cross, brothers and sisters, as I wrap this up, is the foolishness to much of this world, to the Greek, the Scripture says, and it's a stumbling block to the Jews, you won't see a cross in Messianic congregations. But to those of us that are being saved, it is the power of God, and it is the wisdom of God. So on this anniversary today of my personal rebirth, it's what I believe. And you know what, why I believe it? Because I can prove it. Please rise. Let's bow our heads. Father, in Yeshua's name, What do we believe? Is it what we should believe or is it what we want to believe? Peter, do you love me? Of course I love you. Brothers and sisters, Yeshua is asking, do you love me? Do you want to live according to my way? Do you want the truth in your life? Well, Father, our people, we, we, we send mixed messages to each other and to the world. We say that we believe these things, but our life is not witnessing it. It's clear, Father, it's clear from your word that there's a standard by which we have been judged and penalties for, for failing to meet these requirements. Thank you, Yeshua, that you paid the bill of charges, that that was nailed to the tree, that when we stand before the Father in judgment, Father, that we will, that he'll be our advocate, and he will take care of the fine. Oh, that's right. He already did take care of the fine. He prepaid it. Thank you, Lord. But help us, Lord, to be the light that the brothers spoke about. Let us be the ner tamid of the standard of God, which is the Torah, your way, your truth, your life. Let us, Father, be that witness and example, and help us, Father, to be able to explain accurately and truthfully what we believe and why and not just go along for the theological ride without any testament of why we believe what we believe. We will be tested. We will be challenged. Peter told us that. Be ready to give an account for what you believe. Brother, I think we're wholly ill-equipped in these days to give an account for what we believe. So I hope, Father, that each of us today will leave here, but at least, Father, motivation to examine what we believe and why and to substantiate that belief according to your word. And we pray these things in Yeshua's name. The congregation says, Amen. <laughs> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord to lift his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom. B'shem Yeshua Adonai. And the congregation says, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah.